back inside brunch. It's uh, 26 minutes away from the hour, 12 o'clock. We do this every uh, Sunday morning, and I am thankful that you take us in your company, allow us to be in your home. Uh, my guest in the first hour was uh, Mr. Derek Murray. Uh, he represented uh, Transparency Trinidad and Tobago. My guests in this hour, Director Neil Garrick and Giselle Estrada. I know that you want to go into the area of absenteeism. We're going to get there in a moment, but be sure, before we leave here this morning, between you and Ms. Estrada, we are going to deal with this area of dishonesty, which I raised with um, Ms., um, Mr. Murray when he was here. Because folks think that they're being cute in the workplace, but they're affecting everybody. I always tell people, if the guy next to you is being cute, don't think he's being cute and you're helping him by allowing him. He's threatening your livelihood. And they look at me like, well, I do my job. Yeah, you do your job, but if he falls down and the department does not bring in what it's supposed to bring, and invariably they will be cutting me. Okay, I ain't covering for your butt. All right, but you won't talk about absenteeism. Let's go back to that. Uh, and, and I'm going back uh, with Neil Derrick of the ECA. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, sorry, Renny. I, I, I think a point I wanted to make, just mm -hmm. to write on what Giselle said, is that a lot of um, um, workers tend to think that the fact that they have 20 days sick leave and six days EBL and all these provisions that all that should be taken by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So it now it has now become a right, right? While they were created as provisions to provide for situations, it has now become a right. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> it is really the balance that says, even though those provisions are provided, they are not intended that you take all. Now, let me, let me just be clear on this now. You're telling me that my, my bargaining unit went in and negotiated that I get seven days sick leave and I get four days casual leave. Um, it is there for me to use if I need to, but it is not a right to take it. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that. Uh, can one in a performance environment over a period of 10 years, can that uh, max usage be used against someone in the evaluation of, of, of an individual? I, I, know that, I know it's agreed to. But if there's a history of what I can get and not what I can give. You can be terminated, and persons have been. There are mm -hmm. sufficient judgments to show that. The bottom line is that while those provisions are, are, are there, mm -hmm. you also have a contract. And the court has established that if you are absent for more than 10%, yes. that you effectively cannot perform that contract efficiently. And in that regard, it is not intended that you take all the provisions. It's not intended that you that you have family that will die every every week, and that you have and you'll be sick <laughs> <laughs> for twenty days, and you'll have business <laughs> every month. It's really not intended for that. You gotta right? forgive me. I had a I had a Caribbean employee in New York, and one day when he gave me the excuse, I said that family member died six months ago. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. You know, you know. As you extend the joke, I remember. When we were apprentices, um, we had this guy who was having some dental appointments, and one day the, 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 the training instructor asked him, are you an alligator? <laughs> <laughs> you have no teeth on anything else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Clearly understood, yeah. yes. Yeah, but I think that the point I'm making is that we need to first look at that balance that says you have a contract. Mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. contract, whether it's written in explicit, if it's not written explicitly, then it's implicit. Mm -hmm, that says mm -hmm. you have to perform this contract. And in that case, while these provisions are there for you, it's not intended that you're going to take all for the year. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, right? and I think mm -hmm. that has been driving absenteeism because people tend to say, hey, it's coming to the end of the year. I still have five days sick leave. It's not only here, because um, when Giselle, um, Director Giselle Estrada, mentioned a moment ago that we are a partying nation. I mean, it's, it's amazing that you've got a holiday on Thursday. So folks come to work <laughs> Wednesday half day, <laughs> because they only work in half day, they're leaving early. They get Thursday off, and then Friday they come in late trying to recover from what they did Thursday. Oh, by the mm -hmm. way, and it's weekend. Yes, it is. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> 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 no, no, but I, I, I want to take that into the employers, though. Sure. I, I want to take that. That's the workers' side of it, and we know that it is abused by a lot of people. And that is the mentality that has to change because we have a stake. What is it? How does it go? If the employer does not care about the employee's interest, then the employee will not care about the employer's profits. Yes. So it goes both ways. In the case of employers who refuse to accept a new reality, and adjust uh, their profit margin. What kind of discussions 
your organization having with them, your organization, the Employers Consultative Association? So basically, ECA will be embarking on the same consultation. We'll be talking to them along those lines because together when you find that you're in business, there's also a corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. You are employing people. I don't know that the average employer would want to readily put people on the breadline. That has social implications. Mm -hmm. We would not want to mash up families, for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. It means that persons are now in a position where they can't manage their bills. They wouldn't be able to pay their mortgages and so on. So this has a rippling effect in terms of the wider society. We're talking about the children. You mentioned the children a while ago. They may be of school age. So what is going to happen is mm -hmm. that they are not going to continue with their education. So we have to talk to employers along the lines in terms of a holistic approach. Not that we want to appeal to the social side only because it's a business that they're running. And they also have to come to terms with the fact that, as you said, we have to make some adjustments. It is a return on our investments, the return on the assets, and also the return on sales. And we need to do some reality checks because they, are, they also will be operating in the same declining economy. Mm -hmm. They have to come to terms with the fact that the 200000 profit that you would have made in 2015, the painful reality is that in 2014, your balance sheet will have to be made some adjustments for 2016. Mm -hmm. So, and that has implications for your shareholders. Also has implications for your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Something you just have to learn to adjust to. Uh, you mentioned a while ago, uh, Neil Derrick. Uh, that voice you just heard is uh, Giselle Estrada. I'm trying to keep you guys flowing. All right. Mm -hmm. So there is me. And when you hear the lady, is is Ms. Estrada. When you hear the man, is Mr. Derrick. All right, good. Um, you mentioned the ILO. Uh, 2015, the unemployment rate in Latin America and the Caribbean increased for the first time in five years to 6.7%, uh, causing at least 1.7 million people to join the ranks of the unemployed. They are predicting that it will get worse as we go on. So we are looking at some tough times, and we have to find ways of retraining, innovating. One of them we have to do is to ensure that manufacturers find workers. Because too often we hear, um, we can't get workers, and then we hear people saying, boy, I can't get a job. Well, you can get a job. It depends on what job. Talk about the CPAP workers because the proposal has been made that it would be useful, it would be sensible for the nation to take the CPAP workers, retrain them, and get them into manufacturing. There are many who feel that that could um, equal an abuse of workers, many who feel that way. But that, let me not talk about what they feel. Let me hear what you, how you and your organization come down on that. The use of CPAP workers, retraining them, and putting them into some of the industry that we find we have shortfalls. I think we support that 100%. Uh, they, and we've had some consultation with our, with our members around that issue of CPEP. Mm -hmm. My own recollection is that when CPEP was created, it was supposed to be a transitionary process. And rarely it was supposed to deal with a social issue. And I don't think it was intended to create com competition between the two. If I could look at it, we, we, we talk about the public um, sector mm -hmm. and, the, and those that are supported by some subventions of the government and the, and the manufacturers. Because what is happening is, is, let's face it, the Caribbean, where most of our manufacturers trade, the economy there is also depressed. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, you have a lot of competition. Then internationally, you have a lot of the large suppliers who are consolidating. So you're seeing a lot of buy-up. So it, the competition is extremely st um, stiff. If you have CPEP and the rates is, uh, in CPEP is supposed to be more attractive, and in some cases, even though it might, it might be slightly higher, but it does not require a shift, it does not require long hours, it's not under heavy supervision, so obviously it's difficult to move from that sector into the manufacturing sector, mm. and it becomes a real challenge. And in that case, I think, CPEP is also hmm. make work. And I don't think that, that, that we, it's kind of emergent, it goes on on the day. So I think that we have to look at what is going to happen with our manufacturing sector. We have to also look at the agricultural sector in terms of, of, the, of the heavy food imports. Roughly translated, I think your, oh, your, your explanation of CPEP just now was um, let's um, put something in place for our social failure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that might be a, that's what it sounds like. A, a good way, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that at the end of the day, really and truly, we have all these programs. If you look at the education system, for instance, 
our education system is supposed to be best in the world. Mm -hmm. And from primary school to the end of tertiary, you're basically free, including the fact that you get meals all through primary school and secondary school. Where are we going to put all these people? Right? Mm -hmm. Surely not in CPEP. Has to be into making the manufacturing sector, um, sector far more lucrative. Which is what, one of the things that I'm hoping that the tripartite um, suggestion, you will in fact speak to the government, but let's bring in the, 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 the higher learning uh, institutions to give us people who can meet the needs of the country as against merely getting hold of a, 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 a certificate, a, a diploma. I mean, what are we going to do with all, all these um, nurses or doctors or, or whichever? You know? and, and as you've raised that, I think that's good because really the education... Um, Education is supposed to lead the country. Mm -hmm. So what we're supposed to be doing is designing education systems mm -hmm. that makes the, makes the workers far more suited for the, the, um, the jobs that are available mm -hmm. and also for exploiting the resources that we have. So when we import education systems and teach other textbooks that may not match with what we have, we're really wasting money on agriculture, I'm uh, sorry, on education as against making it an investment. And 15 I, minutes. I, and we have to make such a, um, an intervention when we meet in these tripartite talks. 15 minutes before the top of the hour, let me take this uh, across to Giselle just for a moment because Neil mentioned, or was it you? Uh, it was mentioned the question of, it was Neil, CPEP. And, 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 and in fact, exactly what folks are taking home in, in their compensation compared to what is available elsewhere. And whenever I hear discussion going on about um, wages and so on, I wonder sometimes, in, in the case of CPEP, you just talking about how much you're taking home. But if you had um, things like health benefits, you had things like matching funds for retirement and so on, are those not more attractive things that employers can put into the pot to bring people into working for them? As against just talking a salary, you know, here's a salary, but having a, a, a number of those um, services available. Well, the total compensable wage at the end of the day is mm -hmm. always a good thing because when you look at your basic wage, it's hardly ever likely that you you can live on your basic wage. Because mm -hmm. if we're talking minimum wage, that's a painful reality for some people. Yes, I do. And know. I take um, your point mm -hmm. because people have needs mm -hmm. other than to satisfy that food bill. If it is that you were to get sick, yes, one may argue that you pay your health contributions and so on, and you can go to the hospitals. But mm -hmm. what happens when you have to go there and you wait for long hours? Mm -hmm. Like other people, you must have the option to go to a private doctor and make a claim mm -hmm. in terms of your group mm -hmm. health plan. And those are good ideas. My thing, Renny, with that is that incrementally, people must earn these things. And if we're talking about CPEP, all right, and we're giving that as an example. Mm -hmm. I think the whole issue of attitude, and, and I'm not targeting the CPEP workers here, I'm talking generally, workers in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we need to have a different attitude, and that speaks to our work ethic as well. You described it as being dishonest. I have a philosophy that I share with people, and I will share it with you this morning. People in large measure maintain the status quo, unless, of course, there's a requirement to change. We have to create the environment where people will change. Mm -hmm. And the change has to come here from everyone. The workers' representative who are representing the employees, and employees must understand that it's not business as usual. Employers also have to make adjustments. So it's really all hands on board as we go into 2016. We have a lot of work to do. And this, without waxing political, the government has said, the prime minister has said, we need to build back this nation. And in truth and in fact, we have lost that whole idea of discipline. There is no discipline. I like it when you wax political, you know. <laughs> because the Prime Minister makes, it, make, makes the same point he's saying that we have to be honest. Yes. And that is the honesty that I, I, I'm bringing into the conversation here because that honesty, you're right, has to come from each individual. But individuals make up the business sector too. They have, a, a, they, they have yes. some, some real things to answer. Am I giving back to the workers or merely taking out? Am I retraining these people? Am I looking after their interests sufficiently that they understand they are stakeholders? in my success. I don't know if that message is carried out, and that message can only be carried out if that message is understood by he who is to impart that information. And I think it's sometimes how they measure <coughs> costs, because mm. we look at it from a point of profit, and we don't see trading as an investment. So what we have is significant um, rollover, and mm -hmm. if you look at, at those organizations, every time you go there, you meet different um, workers at the, at the cash registers, and, and it is because those things are not 
um, implied. But mm -hmm. organizations that spend money and train, you find they also have workers long term, and you see it benefiting. Uh, you see them benefiting from from in terms of the change in the efficiency. You represent employers. I'm gonna go there again. I keep reminding listeners of that uh, because when you talk about service. I mean, you talk about people at registers, you talk about people at counters, and I go like, they must own this business. Yes. Because they're treating me like they don't need me here, and there is nobody for me to go to. Employees, are they sensitive to this? I mean, I know that one or two places I have seen suggestion boxes. Hey, guys, you know, it is what it is. Don't startle me this morning. Because you see the boxes, and you say, okay, I'm going to put in my two cents in here. And you come back a month later, and you see nothing else. There is a particular place where I am attempted to do wholesale purchase. I'm just giving you that I'm not talking off the top of my head, some experience. I do regular purchase of groceries. I go in and this person, well, first of all, she paid for my groceries because the attitude was that she was paying for it. I complained to whoever it was there. I come back three weeks later, the lady is still in the same place, still with the same attitude. This time she didn't look at me, so she knew I made the complaint. So she, she served me, did her registry thing, looking at the register. Uh, forget about what kind of day you're having. That's irrelevant. Forget about thank you. That's irrelevant. But companies have to understand that too. That is not, I'm not only dealing with me, the customer. I'm dealing that you're helping the individual. And you're putting a standard in your place that, uh, that acts as a contributor to the whole question of productivity. Does it not? Yes. The customer service, that's, that's key. An excellent customer service is a watchword that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. People only use key cards now. They're not because using keys, I'm we sure. Need to, we need to demand. Mm -hmm. We need to mm -hmm. demand customer service. And I'm mm -hmm. happy that you brought the that, that example. Recently, I had a similar experience. My daughter and I went to IAM and company. And the girl was very helpful. And she went on to explain to us why she was so helpful. She said, you know, it's important that I'm... I serve my customers because you all, I need you all to come back mm -hmm. because without you all, I don't have a job. And that for me as an HR person hit home mm. because when I do my training with persons, I let them know you own the business. You have a vested interest in the business. You are a shareholder and you would like one day to have your children work here. Mm -hmm. So it, it is an investment that you're making when you're leaving home to come to work on time, to give your eight hours plus. Mm -hmm. Your return on that investment is not just to have a bonus mm -hmm. or to get an excellent performance at the end of the year, but to be able to say, I'm proud to work for this organization. Giselle, I Giselle, I can shortcut this. When you talk to these workers, listen, I hand you the money. Those people you're selling to pay it. God's sake. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you, you, you know you hit my funny bone on that, right? Yes. <laughs> Neil, Neil, I want to go into the situation with the because you represent employers. I you do. you you know you represent business. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and I know Chamber of Commerce would prefer if I put this question to them, I'll put it to you anyway. Governor of the Central Bank says I'm going to name who took the um the, the, the foreign exchange. And he named them by names. Uh, was that a good thing, a bad thing? How does your organization view that? It, or does the organization have a position on that? Don't think you were going to walk in here and I'm going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know there, there, there seems to be a lot of um, concern around it. I was mm. reading recently whether it was legal to do, and it seems from the way the act is constructed mm -hmm. that he could do it um, and be, be covered. Um, the issue is the intention. And I think it is... We have to look at what was the intention of doing this. Is it really to, to signal you know, where the foreign exchange is going from, or is it really just a matter of cover? I'm still kind of not clear in terms of what the governor of the Central Bank was attempting to, to establish by the publishing of the names. Um, because to me, we have so many other systems that could have actually identified mm -hmm. those who use it and maybe apply some kind of control. So we've published the names. So we now know the names in the newspaper. But what happens after that? Are they going to still draw down on the foreign exchange? Um, are the rates that they're drawing down? What is going to happen? I'm, 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 I'm so ready for us. It is, what is all this for? You see, you brought this on yourself. You're the one started with marks on me this morning. I know we're yes. going political. Don't try to... But what you're doing there is Oscar Durity on me, man. All you're doing is blocking the ball. Hit the ball. <laughs> you know? all, all you're doing is blocking <laughs> In other words, I ain't getting nothing out of you this morning. <laughs> 
a lot of the uh, a lot of the government developmental goals may now be in whole owing to the economic downturn. Does the uh, ECA see an opportunity for greater public private cooperation uh, at this time? I don't know which one of you want to take that question. Surely, surely. I, I think uh, only recently we had this seminar with the ILO and some sponsorship from the UN that um, together. Mm -hmm. We're starting to look at strengthening the institutions, especially the workers' institutions and the employers' institutions, coming together to be able to put some kind of pressure on the government in terms of the, the formation of those laws and stuff. And as, I, as we said, I mean, we, we started talking about the... Because there's so many things, especially in this country, that we get for free. Health, mm -hmm. um, transportation. But we don't build that in. And we don't consider that as income to the public. And... and that's what, I, what I'm saying. When we start talking in general, that says this is Trinidad. Mm -hmm. We have to protect the economy. We have to live within a certain level. We have to make mm -hmm. sure that the manufacturers can manufacture at a rate that they could sell. And we don't find what's happening. Lever has now moved from not manufacturing anything to importing and packaging in Trinidad. So when we look at that, we have to decide where are we going? Uh, could we really diversify? If we have already, we have a manufacturing sec sector that, that could hardly sell anything down the Caribbean. Mm. And, and I think those are questions that we have to ask. And with the government having such deep stake in terms of the ownership of so many of the, of the state enterprises, so heavy in terms of the contribution, in, in terms of subventions, I don't know that it could work without that partnership being strengthened and starting to talk in a holistic way mm -hmm. of all the things that we have in Trinidad as we give consideration to that and not try to pick one out and have one conversation about wages um, at one point in terms of negotiation and then we come back to talk about don't cut gate, don't touch health, right? I think we have to talk about the whole thing um, in a holistic kind of way and that's what we're talking about in terms of tripod, um, tripodism and out of that we think you will find things like formation of, the of public um, private partnerships mm -hmm. because we need to have the investments from the, the private right, in terms of those who hold money to feel that they could invest in this country and get retains in it. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the question for your membership like it is for the country is causation. Nothing is going to happen in a vacuum. It is what you lay down is what is going to bring you the result that you're dealing uh, uh, with. Talk about optimism. I want to throw this area uh, to Giselle for a moment. Giselle, just briefly, are you optimistic? Are you optimistic in the social dialogue that's being called for by your organization, a social dialogue with unions? Are you optimistic with these difficult times that the social dialogue will bring outreach programs? Because I believe that's what we need. You know, um, I, I, I will be the first to point the finger at the employers and say, you've got to find a way to reach out to your workers and have a conversation with them. The same is true, however, of the unions who must do the same thing. Now, you're having these social dialogues. You're calling from them. Exactly what are you hoping to achieve, you, your organization, by natural extension? But basically, our, our achievement at the end of the day, we would want to measure ourselves at least to retain the mm -hmm. workforce, the current workforce. We would try to avoid having to any employer to resort to retrenchment or layoff or um, downsizing for that matter. And that has, as Neil said, has to be a combined approach. It means that our attitudes need to change. We need to let them know what is the reality mm -hmm. out there. We have to engage in training, retraining, and of course, we're hoping that the common denominator would be really be a change in attitude. Mm. We must have that change in attitude, and that has to be the common denominator across the divide for all the stakeholders. It is not business as usual. Mm -hmm. Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago is at a point where we need all persons on board, and that is just not rhetoric. It has to happen. Everybody will be impacted. And I am optimistic because Good. we have what we have going for us is a rich history. We have the key players. We have the voice of experience that we can't discount. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, we have the willingness of all the stakeholders. There seems to be a dose of reality mm -hmm. stepping in. Uh, they actually taking away uh, some money out of the carnival celebration. I <laughs> uh, get it right. Go ahead, Neil. I see you chumping <laughs> at the beat. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. I just wanted to add to what Giselle is saying. I, I, I think that we've started building the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Prime Minister has um, entered some kind of agreement with the unions in terms of the workers' representatives at GTUM. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that has been announced. 
and he has said publicly that he wants to enter more conversations with them. We have had our own um, introductory meeting with the Minister of Labor, and, and she has said at that meeting that she is willing to strengthen the institutions for that type of conversation. Mm -hmm. we, we understand, too, that we have to do some more. So I think starting the 14th of January, as Giselle said, we are going to start work far more during the year to with know. our members, have more breakfast consultation meetings to get their positions on a number of those things that we think we take to consultation. You are in concert for the most part with the um, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I mean, you guys, I'm sure, your liaison. And uh, yes, we we think that that in terms of our our representation has more focus on the requirement the requirements from the ILO. Mm -hmm. Which is, okay. mm -hmm. um, and that has been more or less. <clears throat> there is a 144 convention, which says that we are part of the law forming body. So whenever the the government uh, decides to make law, they have an obligation to consult with us. We can complain directly to the ILO if that does not happen. So um, the, the chamber has focused more on the business okay. end. So I think, I think we have two different niches, mm -hmm. and we could both survive, um, or course. we could work, um, we could complement each other, right, in oh, terms yeah. of us working together. Give me a telephone, a telephone number and a website for uh, small businesses, including individual um, uh, uh, individuals who want to uh, get involved with the organization, want to join, and uh, I need a telephone number and a website that they can go up, because it's important that everybody come under, uh, under the umbrella, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that you're willing to give an outreach uh, to do some outreach programs to get the message out to everybody. So a website and or a telephone number would be useful uh, from you, Giselle. The telephone number at the ECA is 675 Got you. Mm -hmm. And you can log on to us at www.eca. TT.org. Anything I, uh, you guys wanted to impart that I have not uh, extracted from you? Even though I, I let you just slide on the whole question of um, uh, campaign reform, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> 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 Anything you wanted to impart that I did not um, uh, inquire of you? No, really. I, I, no think really. That, yeah, I think we've touched on um, most of the things. Then I let you walk away with uh, Mr. Rambertan and I didn't even bother you with the. I didn't push you any further with the Central Bank. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Rambertan, Mr. Rambertan, yes, because he may get angry with me too for missing his name. Uh, you got to do everything right by that gentleman. Am I opining? Oh, stop it. Um, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, Giselle, uh, Neil, thank you so very much. Thank and, you for um, having us. And I, I thank you and I thank you, um, your CSO, also for being in our presence this morning, all right? Let us not be strangers, uh, because at some point I want to get you folks back here. We have to talk about that area of service. I mean, we, we touched on it, but it is something that we have to get real about. We have to get real in that the public uh, must demand that we be given service. It is a mindset, you see. Folks don't understand it. It's not only going as far as satisfying the person at the counter. It is telling you that this business you're representing is yours. Your money that you get is from me. And if we have that kind of thinking, then there's a greater appreciation for the chance that you get there instead of looking at me like I'm begging you to pay for my groceries. Stop right. it, Bishop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Y'all, thank you so yeah, much. All right? Sure. Thanks a uh, million, Rennie. But I think it's really putting value to work. Yes. As against work becoming a transaction. Uh,